Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good morning and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Jonathan Curiel and I'll be your moderator for today's program called Iran's Regional Dynamics in the Near East. This program is presented by the club's member-led Middle East Forum, whose next program is June 22nd about Afghanistan. You can find more about the Commonwealth Club, its member-led forums, and other events at commonwealthclub.org. And a reminder, we'll have a Q&A um, shortly after the presentation, so please put your questions into the chat. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Banafshe Kenush. Dr. Kenush received her PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and completed coursework at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. She's the author of two recent books, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Friends or Foes, which is an academic bestseller that's been translated into Arabic and Persian, and the book Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East, which he discusses today. The book was conceived during her stay as a visiting scholar at Princeton University in 2017-18, and it examines how 12 countries across the Near East view their ties with Iran. Dr. Kenush has spoken many times at the Commonwealth Club, so uh, welcome back to the club, Dr. Kenush. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, please... Um, if you uh, would like to uh, talk about your book, your book is to totally interesting. Um, it goes into a lot of territory, um, not just Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is a big topic today, uh, especially because of their behind the scenes talks, but also a lot of uh, other countries in the region, the United Arab Emirates, um, Qatar, Bahrain, and other countries that don't get a lot of attention in the news, but deserve to get attention. And they get, they get the attention they deserve in your book. And that's one of the reasons why I embarked on this research. Uh, there was uh, a scarcity of uh, written material uh, about the perspectives of Iran's neighbors uh, on their relations with this important country in the region. And while I was at Princeton, I was asked to convene a meeting and I proposed inviting uh, academics uh, from the region to come to Princeton and to discuss the topic. And that is where this book and when this book was conceived. And um, I wanna, if you allow me, just go straight dive into the material. Uh, I'm very eager to receive the questions from the audience this morning and from yourself. So I'll keep it as brief and as short as possible, but please bear with me because I do have to cover quite a large number of countries. And I've categorized them into three, three groups. Uh, the first is the Arab core, and the Arab core consists of really the um, Gulf Cooperation Council states, the GCC states, uh, an organization that came together in the early 1980s during the Iran-Iraq war to figure out a way to contain any potential threats or real threats emerging from Iran as well as Iraq at the time. The GCC consists of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. I'll start with the smaller GCC countries as they are known, and they are also divided into two categories. One is the Oman-Qatari axis, uh, which tries to merge closer with Iran, not in terms of necessarily interest, but in terms of engagement and the avoidance of any uh, conflict. And then there is the Bahrain, and Kuwait sits near that axis as well. And the other one is the UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi axis that is somewhat more outspoken and vocal in expressing its criticism toward Iran. So with the case of Oman and Qatar, what we have are two countries that seek to avoid conflict at all times. In the case of Oman, it, it is a country that generally follows the regional and international trends that shape relations with Iran. At the same time, Oman sits right across in the south, in the Gulf of Oman, in the, in the southern shores of Iran. 
There are vast economic interests that can link the two countries with one another. Increasingly, Omani ports want to play a more important role in uh, re-exporting Iranian products and commodities, not just within the region, but beyond through the Indian Ocean. And um, besides that, there is a very um, old population, old, by old I mean historically uh, many Iranian Persian immigrants left for Oman uh, over a century or even way before then uh, ago, and um, they form a, a very important business community in this country, and Oman has a Shia community of itself that it engages with. Um, the issue of sectarianism is very placid in the country, more or less. And um, that is also another reason why remaining engaged with Iran is important for Oman. Now, um, Oman also has tensions with the UAE, as you are aware of, on its borders and over the issue of Yemen. Oman, like Iran, has sought a quick end to the conflict in Yemen and event uh, slowly the UAE um, came closer to that point of view in recent years, as of 2018, as you know, um, by deciding to somewhat withdraw from the conflict in Yemen. Qatar steps in here as a country that sits between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and it's very uh, rich in hydrocarbon resources. And it has always felt that it has to protect those resources from its two powerful neighbors. Uh, it doesn't necessarily see Iran as a country that it can engage with as a strategic partner. And uh, regrettably, regional and international issues are such that Iran itself is unable to project an image of, of always remaining a peaceful, although it wants to, and it says it wants to be a peaceful nation in the region, its actions are not always perceived as being fully peaceful enough to enable the building of that strategic partnership with Qatar. Um, so one of the fascinating findings of this book was that unlike what we've read in the media, especially since Qatar was placed on an embargo by Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE in 2017, that um, and, and the idea was that that embargo triggered a, uh, an alliance between Qatar and Iran. That was really not the case. The embargo came about partly because of criticism that Qatar was kind of too engaging with Iran. And so Iran was certainly a factor and a consideration in the embargo. Um, but, but Qatar had way bigger interests in the region with countries like Turkey and beyond the region with Russia and with China, for example, to really ever allow Iran to become its main partner. And as hard as Iran tried to become that main business and economic partner for Qatar during the embargo, Qatar kind of was able to diversify its production needs, um, both locally, domestically, and regionally and beyond. And um, the other important factor in the Qatari-Iranian relationship is a shared gas field in the North Dome, you know, uh, oil and gas field. It is huge. Uh, Qatar needs to protect its part of that share, and it needs peaceful relations with Iran to continue to extract uh, extract energy from, from that hub. The, the United States has a base in Qatar, a military base, when the United States, under the Trump administration, designated the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps as a terrorist organization. Iran reciprocate, reciprocated by designating the al base um, in Qatar as a terrorist institution. And what's interesting is that Qatar said nothing. It didn't take a, a, a stance on the issue and it only tried to urge for peace and a resolution of the conflicts and tensions in the region with Iran. So I've discussed the axis of Oman, Qatar, and Iran. We'll put that aside for the time being, and I'll switch to the axis of the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. In the case of the United Arab Emirates, again, sectarianism is a placid issue, unlike, again, what, you know, 
the discussion um, generally is that sectarianism is a main driver of, of concerns in the region. It really hasn't been in the case of, uh, of the United Arab Emirates ties with Iran. Um, the United Arab Emirates has served as a major trade hub for Iran traditionally. Its famous ports um, actually flourished during the Iran-Iraq war and its uh, potential re-export capacity in the future for Iran and for the UAE is immense. In addition, Abu Zabi has to align the interests of Dubai and Sharjah that have uh, closer economic and social and cultural connections with Iran, with the larger interests of the Emirates altogether. Um, financial concerns drive these interests. And while the United Arab Emirates is a major investment hub regionally and internationally, it's not as major as one assumes. And therefore, avoiding conflict with Iran um, is important. But the United Arab Emirates is a resourceful country and it veers between a level of confrontation and a degree of accommodation with Iran. And this is a pattern that you see across the Gulf region. It's also more vocal in aligning its voice with the Saudi, with Saudi Arabia against Iran at certain points of time and junctures of time. Bahrain's role, strategic role toward Iran is that it serves, again, this is um, something that's often ignored. Um, uh, it, it serves as a buffer bet uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. In other words, it buffers the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And oftentimes, especially in the old days when Saudi Arabia was upset about Iran, it would be the Bahrainis that would utter what that point of discord was first. Saudi Arabia itself would prefer not to say it directly. And um, that means that Bahrain is safe enough because it's, its strategic value to the region is to remain that buffer. And therefore, Bahrain must remain stable enough to be able to buffer, uh, play that buffer role between Iran and Saudi Arabia. That means that Iran is not out there to irreversibly damage Bahrain's security. Bahrain has sectarian concerns with Iran. Uh, it has a major, a majority Shia population. But Bahrain is also beholden to the United Arab Emirates and to Saudi Arabia for its investment needs. It has a somewhat frontier economy. It is energy dependent. And it needs to introduce reforms to be more inclusive towards, um, you know, its population and its citizens. And that said, Bahrain, for these reasons, cannot um, engage with Iran fully. It's, it, its interests really lie in, in other places, but it must maintain that buffer role. Now, we come to the big country, Saudi Arabia, my favorite country, as you know. Um, all the rest of the GCC countries' concerns are a not to be crushed by the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, because they're much smaller. Um, and uh, their interests um, are, 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 are diversified increasingly, and they want to protect those interests. Um, but um, so that means that they're just not only concerned about Iran, they are also concerned about Saudi Arabia. And for the most part within the region, they feel that um, on the, at least on the issue of, say, terrorism, which Iran is often charged with here and there by, by its name, you know, for various actions or alleged for it, allegedly, you know, said that it does this or that. Um, for on the issue of terrorism, the region primarily thinks that the tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, have a bigger chance of causing terrorism than concerns about Iranian provocations or acts of terrorism per se. So they feel that if those tensions subsided, they can very well manage the other tensions with Iran. But then why is the case that the tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran do not subside? They are talking and they have talked at uh, many different points of uh, time in recent history uh, in various forms and shapes. Um, 
But the main reason is that there is a major imbalance of power between them. Their relationship as two major Gulf powers, Persian Gulf powers, rests on their ability to maintain balance. And maintaining balance requires them to also maintain somewhat on par relationships with the United States specifically, as well as with other world powers. Now, you know, Iran doesn't have that relationship, and that's one major trigger of an imbalance of power. The United States policies generally favor Saudi Arabia, and I'm not judging whether that's good or bad, but they do need to veer towards retaining a level of balance in the region so that this power imbalance between Saudi Arabia and Iran does not become irreversibly damaged. At the moment, it has become very difficult for the two countries to fix that imbalance. And so how do we know that? Well, the one way to know that, and, and I have a chapter in this book that discusses this, is that the nature of multilateral initiatives that are being for, um, forwarded in the region to fix the problems between Iran and its Arab core neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, is rather fragmented. They engage in idealistic discussions about let's first build a multilateral security system. Iran um, President Rouhani forwarded the HOPE initiative um, recently to build peace in the Persian Gulf waterway. Um, that really didn't transpire. No one paid attention to it within the region, frankly, as much. Very sad area, but certainly not. Um, so it's a fragmented multilateral structure. And that doesn't work because of that. And it's fragmented because of that imbalance of power. So what's next? is the issue of sectarianism before, be, between them. They have their own minorities of Shias in Saudi Arabia, Sunnis in Iran. And um, while they use um, the Shia-Sunni discord to an extent to forward their foreign policy roles, um, sectarianism is not a driver of their foreign policy concerns at all times. And they prefer to contain it in order to advance more important interests. So where that leaves the issue of sectarianism is in a place that it's that they're very uncomfortable about talking about it, um, and it's, it remains unresolved. Um, and again, this is the case because of the imbalance of power between them, not because of sectarianism per se, but because of that power imbalance. So what's left, you might ask, and what's left is niche diplomacy in recent years, and perhaps in some of, I hope, the talks that they are having in Iraq are more intelligence and security focus because that is what they need to discuss. But, you know, in recent years, they've been saying, well, let's talk about terrorism. But, oh, who's, who, who's to blame for terrorism? Is it Iran? Is it it's Saudi Arabia? Is it some? There's a moral dilution in the definition of the term terrorism between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I won't get into the details now, but as a result of this moral dilution, even niche diplomacy, niche diplomacy is to take a targeted point of discord and try to reach an agreement over it. It's kind of a chic way of diplomacy. Let's talk about terrorism, but oops, there's a moral dilution in the debate. Let's talk about sectarianism, as I described. Oops, there is a moral dilution in that debate. Let's talk about building a region free of nuclear weapons. Oh, there seems to be a moral dilution over there as well uh, on the matter. We don't even know where U.S.-Iran talks will go, whether U.S. will even ignore its Arab allies in the process or decide to attack Iran at some point. And so basically... Niche diplomacy is like Saudi Arabia and Iran trying to be chic on the diplomatic front by, I'm a woman, so I'll give you this example, by saying, yeah, I like to feel chic from time to time by wearing high heels, but oops, I can't really walk more than 10 steps with those high heels. Um, so we'll leave the Saudi-Iranian relationship at, at that level. Um, I want to then go to the second category of countries that this book examines. And this second category involves the periphery states. The periphery states traditionally were called that by colonial powers, and it referred to Iran, Turkey, and Israel. They are periphery because they are non-Arab states. And they sit, if you look at the map, on the periphery of the region. Now, this is something that is often overlooked in discussions about the region. 
And that is that these three periphery states have always felt threatened by the Arab core. And let's not forget that Israel had several wars with the Arab core. Iran had one major war with the uh, with Iraq. Um, and um, basically, Turkey has a lot of tensions with the United Arab Emirates in recent years, with Saudi Arabia, over the, um, over the Muslim Brotherhood, over a, a whole array of topics. So what that means is that while these two, three countries don't see eye to eye often, they do have a tacit understanding that they cannot afford to damage each other's interests to the point that it becomes so irreversible that it gives the Arab core an upper hand in the region, because then the Arab core could pose a potential threat to all the rest of them. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of the relationships? with Iran. Let's start with Israel. Iran has always wanted to build a corridor of influence stretching from Iraq through Syria and more recently into Syria's Mediterranean shores um, to encircle um, Israel uh, and party in the Golan Heights. For many years, Israel was was happy to see the Assad family in Syria because while Golan Heights was a point of contention, they really never tried to reclaim it to, to the point of creating a war um, with Israel on the issue. And in recent years, as we know, Israel is very set on making sure that Iran doesn't get too close to the Golan Heights. Um, but essentially, Israel is in a difficult position it is very upset and very concerned by Iran's actions in this corridor of influence. And it frequently attacks Iranian positions and strongholds in Syria, as we know. But despite all the talk of, oh, there's a war that's going to happen between Israel and Iran. And this talk has been going on at least since 2010. And whenever I, I hear about it or people talk to me about it, I'm like, but, but wait, hang on. And why hasn't it happened yet? And the reason why it hasn't happened yet is exactly why what I explained is, is this dynamic of core periphery that is very strategic and important. But that doesn't mean that things are easy between Israel and Iran. And so the uneasiness and the tensions continue. Now, in the case of Turkey, it's similarly uneasy with Iran, and it has decided to build a compartmentalized policy approach toward Iran, in which it picks, chooses, cherry picks where it wants to work with Iran and where it doesn't want to work with Iran. And a lot of that is shaped by the ebbs and flows in Turkish foreign policy toward other countries, toward the United States. So, for example, in recent years, when Turkey felt that its interest in Syria was somewhat threatened and it became concerned that the United States might kind of build an alliance with the Syrian Kurds, while the Syrian Kurds were somewhat working with the Assad government and hence on a de facto basis with Iran possibly, well, Turkey led two military operations into Syria. But when tensions between the United States and Turkey continued, uh, as we note, uh, the United States uh, imposed sanctions on Iran and that prevented a lot of trade between uh, Turkey and Iran, a lot of commerce between Turkey and Iran. Um, the United States went after a Turkish banker. That, um, and uh, Turkey, um, when the Turkish coup happened recently, uh, a lot of Turks believed um, those close to President Erdogan, or I, I mean, I'm not speaking on that behalf, but, but there was this general idea that maybe the United States had something to do with it. Um, it was at that point that Turkey um, led talks over Syria with Iran and with Russia in the Astana peace process. Those talks are still underway, but if you look at the dynamics of those talks, Turkey and Russia talk a lot more than they do between them than they do with Iran. Um, so um, that's just one example of, of Turkey. And in this book, um, my contributors look specifically at the details of, of this relationship and these dynamics um, from the beginning of the revolution. Every chapter does that, the revolution in Iran in 1979, but more so since the rise of the Justice and Development Party uh, into power in Turkey from 2002 onwards. It delves into the dynamics of the Kurdish factor, 
between Iran and Turkey, which is very fascinating in and by itself. And I can talk more about that later. Um, so this is the periphery. And what's left is Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine. The book discusses their relations with Iran in detail and basically argues that the corridor of influence that Iran has built into the Levant, while it's still sustainable, it is really a corridor of conflict. In the case of Palestine and Jordan, there are far more powerful countries that have influence in those two states, and security is tight, especially in Jordan, and so Iran hasn't had enough influence um, on either of those, as, as one assumes. So I want to go back to the whole idea of the book again and wrap it up. We started this project by asking one simple question, and I wanted my contributors to respond to that question. Is Iran more or less influential in the region? And the answer, surprisingly, may be because, again, everybody talks about Iranian influence always as if it's taken for granted, was that Iran is less influential. Iran's influence is piecemeal, and it has to work very hard to sustain it. It is flexible, it is persistent in trying to do that, and it takes huge risks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that its influence is exactly what the term influence implies. It's a very, very costly endeavor. Um, the second finding of this book across chapters was that um, because the United States policies in the region uh, you know, have ebbs and flows of their own, depending on which administration sits in office in Washington, the countries in the region and the countries that we study have pretty much pat gone past that point of waiting to see what the United States does with Iran at any given point of time any longer, whether, say, the nuclear talks succeed or not. They have moved on from that debate because they cannot invest their resources on that uncertainty for too long, and now have become very uh, proactive in reshaping what Iran means for them. And um, I, I'd be happy to answer more questions, but before I end, allow me to thank my contributors, uh, Professors Nershin Goni and Zeynep Oktav and Visna Gormas from Turkey, who contributed to um, several chapters in the book, uh, Luciana Zakara, Wafa Sultana, who wrote a chapter on Qatar, Hamad al who wrote a terrific chapter on Turkey, uh, I'm sorry, on Kuwait, and also with me on the Levant and um, I just want to say something briefly about Kuwait as well. Kuwait has tried to be a mediator in all of this, and it's driven by three factors. One, its own society that's heavily biased against Iranians that live in Kuwait, um, not because of the sectarian factor, but because the Persian factor precedes the sectarian factor in the Gulf region. The Iranians migrated to the Gulf way before sectarianism became an issue. And they have some discrimination going on in society. Uh, the royal family manages sectarianism quite well. There are three major Shia communities in Kuwait. One uh, follows uh, the Al-Sistani uh, trend in Iraq, um, remaining non-political. The, the second one, the Shirazias, which uh, are opposed to Iran's Shia structure. And the third one, is Ina, which um, is now being sort of um, integrated into Kuwaiti politics, but it felt much closer to Iran, and it does lead engagement initiatives with Iran. Like the rest of the Gulf countries, Kuwait has its own vision for development called Vision 2035, big projects like the Silk City Project. It wants to link Iraq and Iran with Kuwait economically, and so it's really important for Kuwait to be a mediator. That said, um, this is a summary of the book, and thank you very much for your patience. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kenush. Um, you've, you've covered a lot of territory. We want to remind our audiences that this is a program called Iran's uh, Regional Dynamics in the Near East, and Dr. Kenush has written a book um, out very soon called Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East, Near East a piecemeal approach. Um, you get you get into a lot of things in your book, and you also um, thankfully remind us in this presentation today about the um, you can call them contradictions, you can call them um, uh, 
um, uh, conflicting uh, matters, um, uh, religious matters. Um, you're talking about a diaspora. Um, one of the things that you're reminding us is that there are a lot of um, Iranians um, uh, um, and Persians who live throughout uh, the, the Persian Gulf. Um, and occasionally people re are reminded of this through um, headlines. So in 2016, I remember um, Saudi Arabia ended up um, executing uh, a Shia cleric, um, Ayatollah al-Nimra. Uh, and that, that caused a lot of um, headlines in the Middle East. And it was a reminder about uh, the Shia population that exists in Saudi Arabia. You reminded us today about the, the different dynamics that exist uh, across the Middle East. Do you do you think um, one of the points you make is that there's a there's a huge economic interdependence? That was one of the main themes I take away uh, from the book. Do you think that the um, economic considerations really trump all other considerations around religion, um, around ideology, and that in a way, um, despite the headlines we see, it's really the economic interdependence that's causing, for example, Saudi and Iran to um, negotiate recently, fueled partly maybe by the Biden administration's assent. Um, but is it really the economic um, interdependence that people should be focused on rather than the you know uh, issues around terrorism and other things? The economic factor is moving slightly ahead of the rest of the issues. And when they have not heeded the economic factor, the region has paid a very heavy price during the Iran-Iraq war. Combined, the GCC spent $65 billion or plus to contain the effects of that war. Now, having gone through a pandemic uh, and the uncertainty of the tensions between the United States and Iran, the region is more inclined to look at the economic factors. Uh, they, uh, we must add to this debate the consideration that the region is also moving beyond the Iran factor when it thinks about its economy. You know, they're stretching their markets globally into Central Asia, Far East Asia, into Africa, into everywhere around the world. And so um, avoiding tensions in major waterways, including the Persian Gulf, including in the Red Sea, the bubble mandat, is critical to the economic survival and livelihood of all of these countries. So that means a level of engagement with Iran. But back to your question, what does that engagement really entail? Is it going to be strategic? The answer is probably not, um, based on the findings of our book. Um, and that is when factors like sectarianism and terrorism do matter. And that is one reason why, for example, Saudi Arabia has set up in recent years a number of coalitions of its own, a counterterrorism coalition, a military coalition in Yemen. Uh, part of these uh, reasons for these coalitions are to contain Iranian power uh, and influence, not just again in this significant waterway, but around other waterways as well. And, um, and um, that coalition is expanding. It's not necessarily very effective, and Saudi Arabia doesn't want to use it to get into a fight with Iran. But, but it, you know, it, it's happening. Saudi Arabia is being more assertive. And you can make the case about Qatar, about uh, the UAE in their own way, um, their, their assertion of their ties with countries like Russia, China, the United States, means that Iran is not as influential as it would like to think that it is now or in the foreseeable future. Uh, and if Iran doesn't catch up, the rest of the region is ready to move on and, and, and meet its economic needs. Does that answer some of the question? Uh, de de def definitely. Um, you know, as you, as you said at the outset, the book was, uh, the genesis of the book was 2007, 2017, 2018, when you were at Princeton. And you, want, you set out to, to, you know, get into the nitty gritty of the region. Um, you know, news event, news events. Um, you know, have or are, 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 news events have always reminded people that Iran's um, relations with with the countries in uh, throughout the region and also the United States are always fraught, uh, incredibly fraught. Um, you're talking about um, countries that are getting ready um, um, to, a sense, negotiate without um, you know any progress. Um, on, on the U.S.-Iran uh, nuclear talks, or basically the European-Iran nuclear talks with the U.S. on the side. 
But from your perspective, if those talks um, with Europe and by and de facto the United States, if they don't succeed, if sanctions are still in place and these sanctions, you know, have um, completely undermined the middle class and, and other classes in Iran, if those sanctions are still in place, do you see Iran's um, relationship with the other countries and also um, its viability as an economic, um, um, you could say, power? Um, is, is that threatened if sanctions are not, um, um, you know, uh, decreased and not or eliminated? One um, case study in this book is that of Iraq and Syria and Iran's engagement increasingly in what is termed in international relations as para diplomacy, which is that rather than reading, leading diplomacy with the state, they lead, it leads diplomacy with sub-state and non-state actors. Um, as you know, recently Afghanistan is in the news as well, and Iran is kind of thinking how to expand power diplomacy in Afghanistan if things don't work out the way it, does, it wants. Um, so power diplomacy is, is, is something that Iran is heavily invested in. And it seems that um, from uh, domestically that Iran is moving in the direction um, in a, a, of, of increasingly investing in para diplomacy to ensure a level of, of, of influence in the region. So back to your question, when Iran does para diplomacy, what it doesn't necessarily consider is the fact that in the process, it ends up weakening the state factor and its relationship with the state. And even in countries like Iraq and Iran and Syria, it is not the case that the, those two countries, despite being considered allies of Iran, have always been happy with, with Iran. Their leaders have tried to move away from Iran at various junctures. They may not have the power to do it at all times, but they have certainly attempted to do it at different times. And so power diplomacy is a mixed baggage. Iran thinks that through power diplomacy, it brings new actors to, to support state actors in Iraq and Syria. But then it, we know that it leads to all sorts of tensions. It fuels sectarianism at some level. And so, yes, Iran will be in a very difficult position if the tensions with the United States continue, Iran is economically unable to really ca find cash, uh, enough cash during sanctions to run the country and it's it, in its best interest to find some leeway uh, to, to get some resolution in these talks. But increasingly, because the region is moving in, in, in a separate direction of its own, the United States will have to listen to these other interests more than it used to uh, under the Biden administration than it did during the Obama administration when the nuclear talks first started. Uh, we, we, have, we have a question from, from an audience member. Um, it's, it's, the question centers on Egypt and where it fits in. But And I, I know from my experience in the Middle East and writing about it that Egypt, especially under Sisi, is um, completely interconnected, if I can use that word, with uh, UAE and Saudi. Um, there is a kind of de facto political alliance, definitely an economic alliance, a lot of um, uh, f funding into Egypt from, from those countries. C it, um, can you briefly touch on Egypt and maybe um, its connection um, to, to Iran and the other countries in, in your book? Even though, again, that may not be a huge part of your book, but, but it's, it's certainly um, re related. Very much so, and I appreciate the question. Uh, Iran needs Egypt on the issue of Palestine. Egypt is a far more important player on the issue of the Middle East conflict between Palestine and Israel than Iran can ever hope to be. And uh, Iran cannot afford to upset Egypt too much over its actions um, in Palestine. And therefore, Egypt plays a very pivotal role, uh, and Egypt is aware of this role. And while it does not have cozy relations with Iran, their diplomatic relations ended um, way at the beginning of the Islamic Revolution. Um, and um, they have cultural relations at the current moment. Um, but um, Egypt tries to capitalize on that. Egypt and Iran are historically two very important countries in this region. There's a lot of cultural affiliations between the two. So while Egypt is receptive to some of that, um, 
it, it understands that strategically it need, it's, it's, its value comes in its ability to keep Iran at arm's length in the Middle East conflict. And it definitely does that. And as you say, it has some strategic interest building uh, around the Red Sea navigation issues um, with the United Arab Emirates and with uh, Saudi Arabia. Having said that, even during sanctions, Egypt and Iran were able to trade. You would be, you might be surprised to know that Egypt was actually Iran's um, largest uh, trade partner uh, in North Africa and across Africa, uh, the, they had the highest level of imports, a couple of hundred million dollars from Iran. Um, so I don't think that they have an immediate interest in getting into a, a conflict with one another, um, but they both certainly underserved by not having relations as well. What, what, one, of the, one of the things... Um... That, that I found, uh, and this, this relates to your book, I, I think, is that whenever I travel to the Middle East, it, it, I, I see how different it is from my perception of it. Um, I, I'm always reading about the Middle East. I'm always reading about um, Iran and Bahrain and um, Saudi. When you, when you get there, you realize um, just how you know, um, cult culturally connected it is throughout the region, uh, economically connected. In your, in your book, you talk about... Um, how before sanctions, the UAE was the largest source of imported goods for Iran. And I thought just, just, with, just with that sentence, um, it reminds me, yeah, there are so many deep connections, um, central connections, where in a sense, you know, people are relying on these countries at, at, a, at a fundamental level. And, and you, can, you can make it personal by talking about families in Iran who benefit from Iran's... Um, you know, ongoing economic, um, you know, s sustainability, if you will. Um, if Iran suffers economically, it's not just the sanctions are not just affecting and really may not be affecting the higher ups. It's the middle classes and other classes that are really um, suffering. Um, can you can you talk about that um, and just about the, the kind of personal suffering and the personal connections that 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 um, are, are exist across the region. And, and it really is really surprising for someone just reading about the region, just reading about its politics or even its economics. Gladly. I did some field research in the UAE uh, recently, and um, everything you say is very accurate. Uh, I forget the exact number, but there's a large, large um, population of Iranian heritage in the United Arab Emirates. When political tensions increased, I was told that many of them, including families that had lived in the United Arab Emirates way before the revolution, uh, were forced to return to Iran and, and abandon their businesses and homes. Uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of families uh, that were impacted as a result. Uh, even now, you know, when I travel through the Arab world, I go to, it's, I, I love this story. Whenever I go to Saudi Arabia, I go to a local mall to, to, to find Persian food. It's impossible to go to a local mall in Saudi Arabia and not have a Persian food stance. And while the owner is not Iranian, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, the food is very Persian. Uh, and they even call it a Persian restaurant. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't ignore that. Uh, when I went for pilgrimage in, Mac in Mecca, in Medina, I was very respected. They could immediately spot me that I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm you know, we, I'm, I'm probably from somewhere else. I, I'm Iranian uh, by origin. And so the way we read prayers is different from how Sunnis hold their hands when they read prayers. So I would stand out. But they, the, the female security officers would become extra protective of me to ensure that I could comfortably lead my prayers. When I would sit in a cab to drive from Jeddah to Mecca to go perform my pilgrimage, the cab drivers would always say, where are, you, where are you from? And me being rather adventurous, you know, I, I travel alone, so people like to strike a conversation with me. And I'm, where are you from? And I'm always like, I'm American because, you know, over here, I always call the State Department, I, my friends in you know, the State Department, my everybody, and they say, when you go, just say you're American. So I always say I'm American, and they go, come on, where are you really from? I'm like, well, I'm really, I'm really, I'm going, no, 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 okay, I'm Iranian, and I, uh, I'm born in Iran. And as soon as I say that, I swear to you, 
This last trip, the cab driver stopped in a local gas station, went to the shop. He got a whole bag of candies, chocolates, water, juice, and brought it back in the car and gave it to me so that I, he, I would have some food when I would start my pilgrimage. And um, these are, you know, small stories, but I want to go through the economic side of the story. Right now in the United, even inside Iran, the Chamber of Commerce of Iran is saying, please, we need relations with the United Arab Emirates. We need this re-export capacity because the United Arab Emirates presents the cheapest routes for Iran to export its good to the rest of the world. We are suffering. If they, even if Iran goes via Qatar or Oman, it's more expensive simply because they don't have the same port capacity as the United Arab Emirates has. So... Back to your question, it's in everybody's best interest, especially the middle class, if these economic factors are taken into consideration. I appreciate your, your answer on that. Um, I want to remind uh, audiences that uh, we're talking with Banaf Sheikh Kanush, author of the new book, Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East, a, a piecemeal approach. And um, yeah, there are a lot of pieces to uh, Iran's dynamics uh, throughout, throughout the region. Um, I, want, I want to return to a, a subject that uh, we talked about earlier, and that is um, Iran's nuclear ambitions. Um, one question is, is whether you think um, uh, President Biden will be effective in controlling those ambitions and, and that negotiations, you know, uh, that are happening ongoing, um, direct and indirect will bring about, um, a kind of, um, well, it's certainly bringing out a re-examine of, of the, uh, accords that were reached under the Obama administration, but we'll bring, we'll bring about something akin to a definitive agreement between the countries, even if it's not perfect. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And even, you know, um, one, one, one question I may add is, um, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of weeks about Israel essentially trying to undermine uh, those talks through uh, sabotage of Iran's um, and, uh, enrichment facilities, um, assassinations, that sort of thing. So th that that may be a you know quote unquote X factor to this. But um, if you could just talk about that, that would be that would we would welcome that. Absolutely. What I have to say might be quite different than what others say. So I take full responsibility for my own views here, but, but I'll try to formulate it in as in, informed a manner as I can. To your back to your question, certainly everybody wants that to happen, to have somehow a kind of deal that is workable enough, even if it's not ideal. And uh, in my opinion, even the hardliners in Iran want that. Even the Islamic Revolutionary Guards in Iran want that. However, Iran is divided on the issue of how to reach that point. And for uh, the hardliners, many of them have pretty much given up on the idea that they can um, work with the United States. Um, they were ambivalent about the outcome of the nuclear talks, even under the Obama administration. But when President Trump came and, you know, put back the sanctions regime and withdrew the U.S. out of the deal, well, there, you know, there's really no definitive guarantee that such trends might not happen in the future. And so the hardliners in Iran believe that given that Iran has very limited resources to ensure what influence it has in the Near East region, it better invest that resource elsewhere. And elsewhere, for example, could mean power diplomacy. And on the power diplomatic front, the US and Iran don't always see eye to eye. Now, sometimes they might, for example, you know, when the two were fighting the Islamic State in Iraq, Iran's hardliners hope that at some point they'll, they'll, the Americans will try to see the Iranians for what they are and accept them the way they operate and hopefully build a nuclear understanding around that. And one that does not necessarily yield Iran's ballistic missile um, capabilities, its defense capabilities, even its nuclear uh, capabilities to a large extent, because it's the IRGC's job to protect Iran, you know, and, and that's how they protect Iran through those means. Um, so back to your question, if they're divided about whether they want to be on board on with the U.S. or not, then 
it may well be that the outcome of the nuclear talks could be sabotaged again at, at some point. And there's certainly enough provocations in the region. As you say, Israel has its own concerns, and I don't want to dismiss those concerns. I want to reiterate that any concern that Saudi Arabia and Israel, for example, have about Iran is, is quite valid. It's quite valid because, again, go, going back to the story I gave you, if the hardliners feel that their influence is ensured through other means, for example, para diplomacy, which doesn't always mean the same thing, you know, the rest of the region likes to engage with state actors, usually in international relations. But the Iranians are saying, well, para diplomacy is, is increasingly a norm and we're good at it, so we're going to do it. So they're, they're going to ruffle some feathers there, and it remains to be seen how much that will ruffle through nuclear talks or not. It's a million-dollar question I can't give you a uh, full answer to at the moment. To totally understandable, Dr. Kanush. <laughs> totally understandable. Um, we, we, ha we have about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, you, you, talked, you talked about the um, historic Persian communities that exist throughout the, the Gulf region. Uh, we, we talked about Israel. Um, there's an historic community that often um, uh, get, gets ignored, uh, and that is uh, the, the, the uh, Jewish Iranians, um, Iranian Jews that exist. When I was in Iran in 1993 and also 2004, um, uh, I, 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 was, I, I made a point to um, try to understand uh, better the Jewish community in Iran, which is, from my, from my understanding, there are about 20 to 30,000 um, Jewish Iranians, and they have a, you know, they're, they're they have a political um, existence in the country. Um, uh, they they identify as Jews, but they definitely identify as as Iranians. And one may see this as a contradiction. I, I don't see it as a contradiction. Um, having talked to them, it, um, it's incredible to see how uh, um, embedded they are in Iranian culture. Um, I, I just wonder if you could talk about. Um, in a way, you know the contradictions that that that, that Iran um, has, not only culturally but in a sense economically. I mean, I think when I was first in Iran in '93, seeing the Iranian stock exchange, for example, like this, this somehow this is a disconnect for me. It shouldn't be. Um, it makes sense that there's a stock exchange, but I have to be honest. It, it was a little bit, um, you know, of a mind. We would call it my, a mind blower in California. Um, but can, can you talk about that? You know, uh, we're, in, in essence, I'm asking if you can talk briefly about the real Iran versus the perceived Iran. Absolutely. And that is why it's so essential uh, for Americans um, to travel to Iran, for, uh, for everybody to travel, travel to Iran, uh, because from the outside, it presents a lot of contradictions. But um, I was telling an American friend of mine that I really loved to an extent growing up in Iran because you learn how to negotiate through those contradictions. And that is a skill set you really need in order to be a good political analyst. If you lack that skill set and you don't make up for it through travel, and then you sit you know, in your own high chair and pass judgments on other countries, you're bound to miss all the rest of the story there. And so going back to some of the stories that you say, for example, about the Jewish community, you know. I, when I came here many, many decades ago, I began dating a Jewish gentleman. And I remember uh, kind of coyishly calling my uh, relatives in Iran to make an announcement. And then at the very end of it saying, um, by the way, uh, he is Jewish, you know, when things were serious. And the immediate response I got across the board from all my relatives were like, wow, we're really surprised you even bring that up. And, you know, and uh, I remember that one of my relatives was really cute. He said, you know, I, you really forget that we were all Jewish before we became anything else in this part of the world, which I love. I loved hearing. Um, so uh, I'm sure the Jewish community in Iran as a minority has faced all sorts of discrimination. I don't mean to dismiss that. Me not being Jewish at the time, I raise a, a half Jewish household now, but I'm not aware of what they are, admittedly. But from my experience, um, you know, they're very proud of their Persian heritage. And you can you'll know that immediately when you go 
to New York, Manhattan, or you go to Los Angeles and you meet with the Persian Jewish community and they are very, very uh, proud of their Persian heritage. So that some, says something about it. And we all have very fond memories of Israel. Before the revolution, Israel developed Iran's agricultural sector. Iranians used to go to Israel for their most urgent medical operations and surgeries. Um, Israel was, was the destination for many Iranians rather than the West. And I think even Israelis are traumatized by the fact that that caring relationship broke down. And for by the same token, many Iranians are traumatized by it as well. And because of the securitized nature of Israeli-Iranian relations, there's really no room left for, for civil society groups to, to comfortably say what they want or what they feel, which is that, you know, there's really, and I, as I explained strategically, Iran doesn't necessarily gain by making Israel an enemy and nor vice versa. But having said that, for, for security factors, Iran is dead set on encircling Israel and Israel dead set on encircling Iran. So that's one part of the dimension. I can go into the Iranian community. I mean, you go across the Arab world, you go um, across North Africa. There's not only a deep a historic Shia influence in the region, but predating that is the Persian influence in the region. And I have personally faced nothing but respect in my travels in Saudi Arabia always respect, um, always a fascination with, with who Iranians are and admiration for the capacity of this country for its educated population. So I, th I think I should start stop boasting about it. Okay. Yeah. No, I appreciate your, your, your comments, uh, especially as they relate to your, your personal life and, and um, other things. Uh, we have about eight minutes or so left. Uh, I, I do want to, again, remind our audiences that we're talking to Dr. Banafshe Kanush. Uh, she's the author of the new book, Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East, a Peace Meal Approach. Um, as, as we said, uh, um, Dr. Kanush, the, the book is, is, is on the precipice of being published. It may come out today for, for that, for all we know. It may come out tomorrow, which is great. Um, I want to ask you this. I mean, you, you spent, you know, several years on the book. You've worked with, um, other academics, other writers. Um, this is as much um, an overview of the region as well as a kind of, you could say, an investigation of the region and an update, a refresh of the region. Um, your, your previous book that we mentioned was, has been an academic bestseller. Um, let me ask you this. W what do you hope your book accomplishes? In other words, do you want it to be read by academics, by politicians in the region, um, by a lay audience? And if so, what, what, what do you hope come, comes out of this book? I mean, and I, I mean, like, you know, what's your, what's your um, fantasy in a sense, or maybe, maybe what's the reality? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, and I say this humbly, I want world leaders to read it because I think that they're very uninformed. Um, and unfortunately, it impacts the lives of ordinary people like ourselves. Um, and um, they're so busy and so sophisticated with the amount of decision making and, and power and wealth at their disposal that it's, they have very little time to really read the facts and, and the facts that are handed down to them are not always up to date. As we said early, um, there's hardly anything written about what these countries think about their relations with Iran. This is one of the first um, publications on this subject. Um, and while academics in these countries talk about it, you know, to, to produce something that is academic and publishable in English in the United States of America is a rarity. And that is one reason why the guests that I invited to Princeton came from the region. Um, it was very important for me to have the point of view of these people and then transform that into an English book. Now, I, I write simple, I, um, I, I talk simple, I write simple. So while the book is academic, it's very readable. You'll, you'll be able to really, you've seen it, you've read it, you, you'll be able to read through it pretty comfortably. So um, while the details of it are, are um, suitable for, I would say, policymakers, decision makers, um, senior grad level students, I think that you know a certain group of undergrad students would find it useful. The public that is interested in the region will find it a beautiful flow because it's a book that focuses on strategy, on security, on trade, on economy, on people, on culture, 
on um, Shias, on Sunnism, on how all of this wraps together to present to us the new reality of the modern Near East. I appreciate that. We, we have one final question. Um, the question from the audience members, is, is Iran likely to become more secular when the current leadership um, dies off? And I know, I mean, I have to say that when I was in Iran and, um, you know, again, a, a more than a decade ago, seeing then President uh, um, um, um go through the streets of Tehran, how embraced he was, how he represented a kind of um, cultural um, upheaval, you could say. Uh, a lot of people, he he did have a humanities background, very much so. And so um, I think it does relate to this question about, you know, Iran perhaps becoming more secular. Um, uh, interesting question, if you could, you could answer that. One of the beauties of uh, Iranians, and I would say, I would argue across the region, I've seen this, is that people are very comfortable living with their secular and their religious side together. So, you know, you could be in a family that's half secular, half religious. You could be in a family. Most families have some religious, you know, beliefs. Um, um, my own family was a rarity of being really, really non-religious, but it was very rare to find it. And I lived very comfortably with my religious friends and, you know, uh, vice versa. So, I would probably rephrase this question, if I may, and say, to what extent is Iran able to demonstrate an ability to separate religious considerations from state considerations from its national interests? That's a very tall order, because under the revolution, um, ideology fuels uh, a, a revolutionary worldview that hasn't died yet. Um, I'm not certain that it will die even if this government were to vanish. Um, ideology, as in the case of the Taliban, as in the case of the Islamic State, has a way of resurfacing. But what I do know from experience is that when Iran is weaker, ideology gets stronger. Its ideological undertones of its foreign policy become more prominent. But when it is a stronger country economically and in many other fronts, ideological factors tend to take the backseat and more pragmatism tends to kick in. And I think that's what the region, what the Iranians hope will happen in a peaceful transitional manner. I don't see the prospects of that yet happening. Uh, I'm going to sneak in one last question. Maybe we have about a minute, minute and a half left. Um, as, as we leave this program, I mean, you, your, your, your ear is to the ground, as it were. Um, you're, you're following negotiations that are happening um, right now. And negotiations are really happening all over the region. They're, they may not be getting headlines. What, what's, what's your, what's your um, honest take on whether this will um, seed the region with, with a, with a, into a new era of peace or um, cohabitation, I want to say, political cohabitation. I think, let's take the example of negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. Iraq is a good country to have some level of negotiations. Iran has always wanted Iraq to serve as a bridge between Iran and the rest of the Arab core region, uh, economically, politically, et cetera. And Iraq has so many experiences with really tense security issues that it's in a, it has a lot of experience under its sleeve to say, well, let's sit down and see how we can lower some tensions. But no country in the region, when it comes to the Saudi-Iranian relationship, is in a position um, to fix that, the tensions between them. No regional country, no world power, nobody. The reason is that the issue is about the imbalance of power that has been exacerbated as a result of foreign interventions over time in the region. And it's very difficult to rebalance that. I'd explained it in my talk. Rebalancing that is something that Saudi Arabia and Iran must slowly do, and US policies and other world power policies must gradually support from long distance. They can't go and sit in the middle of those talks because they caused some of that imbalance. They caused a big part of that imbalance 
right? And because the relations are so securitized, they're not, the Iranians are not going to open up and talk about their security concerns in front of anybody, except directly with the Saudis, maybe a little bit with the Iraqis. So while I appreciate the efforts, I, I'll be very honest with you, a whole a different understanding must emerge. Now, the nuclear talks are a different subject, and whether or not they reach an agreement on that, I'll tell you, Iran will not abandon its missile program, it will not abandon. What else it is that its, its allies, I just said that it wants to expand its power diplomacy. So either the rest of the world starts to understand and accept Iran for what it is, or it doesn't. I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kanush. You, you're talking about a region out of balance that we hope will be in balance more so in the next uh, year and, and longer. Um, I'm Jonathan Curiel. I've been your moderator for today's program called Iran's Regional Dynamics in the Near East. Today's program will also be available on YouTube. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California celebrating over 117 years of enlightened discussion is adjourned.